Hello, everyone. So uh, it is 7.42 uh, in Queensland, and there isn't anyone apart from myself who is in this tutorial. And uh, instead of just canceling the whole thing, I've actually waited for some time. I think I'd just much rather uh, do the tutorial kind of on my own by answering my own questions. Okay, so let's talk about immunity. Um, immunity is important because as we previously learned, um, it is a crucial attribute of states that they have what is known as sovereignty. And sovereignty refers to the plenary power of a state to make rules, uh, with, especially within its territory, and to ensure that those laws are enforced, and so that anyone who violates those laws can then be tried. So those are the components of sovereignty. And yet, even if we understand that I'm trying to think how, how to make the, <laughs> the Zoom session different from immunity. Okay. Uh, different, the Zoom session from a lecture podcast. Okay. Now, but we do understand that notwithstanding uh, the sovereignty that every state possesses, which is recognized in international law, we do recognize that it actually has certain limitations. And one of the limitations of the sovereignty of a state refers to what is known as the, so the sovereign immunity of other states. And so, exa for example, uh, the question might arise whereby assuming that a particular state, say state A, uh, enters into a contract with a company in state B. And let's assume that that particular contract relates, for example, to um, the purchase of equipment for the government, maybe perhaps uh, in relation to its uh, educational sector, could be in relation to its uh, power generating sector. And let's assume that there has been a breach uh, of contract by state A. The question then becomes, would a company which is in state B be able to file a suit against state A on the basis of a breach of contract. And one of the other questions we'll be asking tonight is that assuming that, you know, um, let's assume that you have a diplomat from state A who has been, who is accredited by state B and state A and that particular uh, diplomat then commits a crime such as by killing or even assuming that that, that, that dip accredited diplomat uh, rapes and murders a citizen of state B within state B. And let's assume that uh, that particular diplomat has actually been caught red-handed and uh, the police is just about to arrest that diplomat. The question is, can the police of state B do that? And we will realize that the, uh, the, state, the police of state B cannot because of the principle of uh, sovereign immunity, immunity uh, which actually, by extension, extends to uh, the official representatives of a sovereign state in another state. So tonight, we talk in this tutorial, which I'm the, and of course, I'm the only one here. We're going to be talking about the uh, principle of uh, immunity. And so after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain, one, the customary law of state immunity, and two, who are entitled to claim immunity. So let's begin by uh, looking at discussion question one, which is actually, which I actually lifted from, uh, from the textbook uh, by Abbas, and which of course is our prescribed textbook. So the first question is, uh, goes this way. The, the Ministry of Defense of Kandoma ordered boots for its armed forces from Rotamu, the ship which brought in the goods from Utamu experiences difficulty when it arrives at the port in Kandoma due to ongoing construction work in parts of the port. The goods entered into demerage. The Rotamu One Shipping Company asked for payment, but Kandoma refused. The company sued Kandoma before a Rotamu One court, asking the court to grant its application to seize some property belonging to Kandoma in Rotamu. Kandoma argued that the court has no jurisdiction on the basis of immunity. Advise the parties. So obviously, if you're watching this video, um, I'll give you a, some time to think about that question. 
So think about that. Okay, I think it might be ready by now. Um, the essential legal issue, really, uh, in this in relation to this question, is whether or not the transaction that the Ministry of Defense of Kandoma entered into with um, with a Kandoman company uh, is a co commercial transaction, or is one which is governmental or sovereign. And um, the reason for that is that by now, if you went through the lecture notes, read through the textbook, or watch the lecture podcast, the reason for that is that the, the previous doctrine of absolute unity of uh, foreign states in international law uh, is no longer accepted. So in the past, uh, courts of foreign states would uh, recognize the sovereign immunity of a foreign state, regardless of whether or not that foreign state was engaging in something commercial, such as you know entering into a contract uh, for the purchase or supply of goods, or it could be because that particular state, foreign state, uh, took out a loan, or it could be in relation to hiring of um, uh, employees of a host state, and. In that particular case, regardless of whether or not the transaction can be categorized as sovereign or commercial, sovereign means that uh, it is obviously, the transaction is obviously crucial to the operations of a state as a state. So it's governmental. You know what governmental is. It relates to education. It relates to the uh, military, for example. It relates to health. Now, so those would be governmental functions which are crucial in every single state. Others would have to be commercial activities, mainly, therefore, they're driven, for example, example by profit motives or uh, by market forces. And so in the past, because of the, the, the doctrine of uh, absolute sovereign immunity, uh, the courts would not make a distinction whether uh, between transactions uh, which are entered into the estate on the basis of uh, a governmental need, or whether or not, uh, or whether or not it's really founded upon a uh, commercial, uh, a commercial pursuit or commercial purpose. However, uh, following the the, uh, the case of Trentex versus uh, the Bank of Nigeria, the UK Court of Appeal uh, made a groundbreaking. Uh, decision in the sense that it made a distinction between transactions which are undertaken as part of uh, governmental or sovereign purposes as opposed to transactions undertaken by a foreign state solely on the basis of a uh, commercial purpose. So that if the purpose of the transaction is commercial in nature, then in that case, um, the doctrine of uh, sovereign immunity will not apply so that it will be permissible uh, for, a, uh, for a host state to be able to hear a court action that impedes a, a foreign state. So having discussed the, that basic principle, we then have to examine um, this particular uh, discussion question by asking whether or not the transaction that the Ministry of Defense of Kandom entered into uh, is one which involves a sovereign or governmental purpose or one which has a commercial purpose. Now we know from the facts that uh, the contract was entered into for the purpose of supplying boots for the armed forces from, uh, of Rotamo. Sorry. Uh, Armed, uh, boots for the armed forces of Kandoma. Obviously, therefore, if it's, it pertains to the needs of the armed forces of Kandoma, that has to be a sovereign or government purpose. So we begin by asking the question, is this transaction uh, one which is sovereign or governmental, or is it one 
which is motivated uh, mainly by a commercial purpose. And it is clear, therefore, that this is of a sovereign nature. And because the contract is one which uh, involves uh, supplying uh, the armed forces of Kandoma, it is therefore of a governmental, a governmental transaction, then in that case, uh, Kandoma can raise the defense that uh, it is immune from suit on the basis of the fact that this is a, a uh, clearly sovereign or governmental, uh, that the transaction is clearly one that involves a governmental or sovereign uh, purpose. So in that case, uh, Kandoma can claim uh, immunity and therefore the Rotomo One Court cannot exercise jurisdiction over Kandoma. So let's go to question two. The Ontario police was called to a residence where one of its occupants had reported a domestic incident. When policemen arrived at the residence and knocked on its door, they were met by a blood-soaked gentleman who introduced himself as James Blast, the Consul General of the State of Lunario. Mr. Blast then told the policemen that as the Lunarian Consul General, he was refusing them entry into the property. Antoine police looked through the windows of the house could see that a blooded woman was lying immobile on the floor. When one of the Antoine policemen called their headquarters, it was informed that Mr. Blast was in fact an accredited dipl diplomat of Antoine, but that the house was not an accredited diplomatic residence. Given the tricky situation, we have been called as a solicitor to provide advice to the police. Can the Antoine policeman enter the residence of Mr. Blast? And two, can he be arrested for committing a crime? Advise the Antoine police. So again, um, I'll give you a few seconds to uh, think about that particular question. Okay, so I guess it might be uh, about time for us to answer this particular discussion question. So we begin by noting that it is, there is a customary international law that recognizes the immunity of um, heads of state. And obviously that is uh, an extension of the, uh, of the customary law on uh, sovereign immunity. Because as we know, states function through individuals. States function through its government officials. And so therefore, uh, it, would, it would be a uh, perplex, perplexing situation where a state, for example, has sovereign immunity, but the head of state cannot. So uh, it is a uh, customary international law that there is uh, immunity on the part of heads of state. And through time, there has also been uh, a recognition that it shouldn't just be heads of state, but certain accredited diplomats or ambassadors uh, who should also be given uh, diplomatic immunity because you can just imagine that in a context, for example, of, of wars breaking out between two states, if uh, diplomats and ambassadors uh, could be arrested and could be tried, then uh, it would be quite dangerous for uh, various ambassadors to be meeting because they could be arrested. So uh, through time, uh, there has been as well a customary international law giving immunity to uh, diplomats of, uh, of states. Now, that uh, particular immunity as recognized in customary international law uh, has of obviously be in code, has been codified in the Vienna Convention on Diplomats, and eventually there was also a Vienna Convention on Consuls, which means therefore it wasn't just diplomats such as um, ambassadors who are given immunity from jurisdiction in a host state, but also consuls. Now consuls exact, aren't exactly diplomats, 
uh, in, in the sense that uh, the, the, the function of, uh, of a diplomat is really in relation to uh, the, the uh, relationship between two states. That's why they're called diplomats, because they, they uh, have a transaction with, with each other. Consuls, on the other hand, are actually there for the purpose of assisting the, uh, the citizens of a foreign state that are residing in a host state. So they're not, they're not particularly uh, involved in the process of diplomatic relations between the two, two states. So there is a Vienna Convention on uh, consular officials, which also provides, gives them diplomatic immunity, or at least immunity from the jurisdiction of a, of a, uh, of a, of a host state. So having said that, uh, there are two aspects, therefore, to the question. The first one is, can the Antoian policeman enter the residence of Mr. Blast, who is an accredited uh, consul general? And so, therefore, uh, it, it's clear that Mr. Blast is uh, protected from uh, arrest by the uh, Vienna Convention um, on Consular Relations. So, in this particular instance, in relation to the question of whether, whether or not Mr. Blast uh, can be arrested for committing a crime, the answer is no. Simply because he has uh, immunity on the basis of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Now, so the second question, can the Ontarian policeman answer the residence of Mr. Blast? That would have required uh, answering the question of what is the nature of the residence? Is it an accredited diplomatic residence in the sense that it would then be considered to be a part of the territory of the foreign state. Uh, we know from the facts that it is not. Uh, given the fact that it is not, uh, it is within the power of the policeman to actually enter the residence of Mr. Blast because those are not, that residence is not a, uh, a diplomatic uh, residence or a diplomatic property. If it were a diplomatic property or it were a diplomatic residence, then because that particular diplomatic residence would be considered to be part of the territory of the foreign state, then a foreign policeman wouldn't have been able to enter. But because, uh, it, as we said, uh, based on the facts, it is not accredited as a diplomatic residence or diplomatic property, then it is considered solely to be the proper the part of the territory of Antwario. So in relation to question one, yes, the policeman can enter the residence of Mr. Blast, given that the residence is not a diplomatic property and therefore not considered to be the part of the territory of uh, of Lunario. As to the second question, uh, Mr. Blast cannot be arrested for committing a crime because um, of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which protects uh, those who are accredited uh, consuls from arrest or prosecution or investigation even by the uh, police and officers of the host state. Okay, so we've answered uh, questions one and two, and that's it for tonight. And uh, I wish all of you a Merry Christmas. I hope to see more of you next time. I can only imagine that many, many of you perhaps decided not to be at tonight's tutorial in order to focus on the assessment which, which is due on Saturday. So. Good night, and I'll see you again next year, and have a Merry Christmas. Good night, everyone. Bye.